pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, if you're interested, right off the bat, let me give you our websites. Uh, PatriotsHistoryUSA.com, PatriotsHistoryUSA.com for all the books. If you teach out of the book, we have a free site there. It doesn't have a full curriculum, but it has test bank questions for all the chapters. It has some study guides. It has additional material. It has map links, so it has a lot of stuff. Um, if you teach out of it and you want a full curriculum, a friend of mine has a site called classicalhistorian.com. And classical historian, classicalhistorian.com. And it has, he teaches out of both Patriots History and the Patriots History Reader. The Reader is a documents book. I noticed I did not bring a copy of the Reader with me tonight, sorry, but you can... You have, oh, Ron says they have copies of the reader here. So it, it's the actual documents. Patriot's History, of course, is our story about the documents. So Classical Historian has a full curriculum if you want to teach out of it. It's in great use among homeschoolers. Finally, for all of the new film work, which is what I've been doing mostly recently, if you'll go to Rockin' the Wall Studios, R-O-C-K-I-N, rockinthewallstudios.com and look at projects and you'll see all of the movies that we have been doing, one completed, one almost done, and then two, as they say, in development. It means we don't have the money for them yet, but we're working on it. But take a look at the Patriots History trailer on the rockinthewallstudios.com website and have a hanky handy because it's a phenomenal trailer. We, we got rights to use Michael W. Smith and his music, and he's agreed to do the music for us if and when we get the money to produce it. So PatriotsHistoryUSA.com, ClassicalHistorian.com, RockinTheWallStudios.com. Some of you may know my background. Uh, I went to Arizona State University, and all the way through high school and college, I was a rock drummer, and I went on the road with rock and roll bands immediate, uh, immediately after graduating. And we opened for bands like Steppenwolf and the James Gang and Savoy Brown. Uh, I had pictures for you, but in my forgetfulness and also in teaching summer school where I have to move my sticks around, I brought everything except the sticks, which had the pictures on them. So we'll do the show without pictures tonight. But I did have a picture of me in the rock band. And uh, you'll have to watch our movie rockinthewall.com to see that. It goes by fairly quickly, but it's in the movie. Now, uh, as for the table back there, I brought a lot of titles. Uh, I discounted all of them. Uh, what would the founder say is only five bucks tonight. Uh, the movie is only ten bucks if you want a copy of Rock and the Wall. It's been on that evil liberal station PBS. We also sold it to Mark Cuban's HD.net. This fall, we're touring with Rock and the Wall, and we've got a 40-city national tour because this is the 25th anniversary of the Berlin Wall falling. And so we're going to be in L.A. and we're going to be in, uh, in uh, Phoenix. We're going to be in Atlanta. But we're also going to be at the Churchill Museum at Westminster College where Winston Churchill gave the famous Iron Curtain speech. And we're going to be at Eureka, Eureka College where, you know, Reagan went to school. So we've got some pretty great places on this tour coming up this fall. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about this at the end. It was a single history professor in a summer session almost right about this time back in 1976 that changed my life and turned me from a rock musician and put me on the real road to perdition, better known as academia. Uh, for a number of years, I wrote standard books that only two or three scholars would read. And then sometime in the 1990s, I decided I, if I was going to take the time to write a book, I wanted somebody to read it. Mike Allen and I had become friends, and we discussed the terrible state of U.S. history textbooks, and we decided to write our own. And we were convinced that we would end up selling Xerox copies out of the back of a truck. That's, uh, you know, we, we just didn't think that anybody would, would pick up our book. 
But Patriots History of the United States uh, managed to find a publisher, Sentinel, and it was something of a hit as well as well-reviewed. Um, as I said, my goal was to have people read it and then discuss the ideas therein. Um, but we never dreamed we'd have this kind of success. We're coming up on the 10th anniversary of Patriots History of the United States this November. It's been through 20 printings. It's had over 330,000 sold half a million in print, and they're publishing a brand new 10th anniversary edition this fall. We revised it, and it goes all the way up through uh, 2013. So we take on Obama, naturally. Um, <clears throat> that was fun. Um, it, it, you may know the story. Uh, the, the book came out, and it did okay. It did well. It was reviewed by the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and so forth. Um, and it had good sales, but then in 2010, after writing a couple of other books, I was asked to be on the Glenn Beck Show, and I brought him a copy of Patriot's History and uh, 48 Liberal Lies. And Glenn's response was, I know this book. Do I know this book? I know this book. Well, any of you who've ever read Patriot's History of the United States, first reaction, it's a great book. Everything I write is not a great book, but that's a great book. And uh, Ron was talking about the, the writing style. I am here to tell you there are phrases in that book I do not use. There, there is language and words in that book I, I just don't use. It was written by somebody else. Parts of that book, I believe, were written by the Holy Spirit because I don't use some of those words and sentences in my sentence structure, but there they are, okay? So Glenn looks at it and he goes, do I know this book? I know this book. So I knew he didn't know the book. I knew he hadn't read it. I get a call five days later at home. Hey, Larry, this is Glenn Beck. Yeah, hi, Glenn. How are you doing? He says, when you were on the show, I hadn't read your book. I go, I know. That's okay. He says, no, I read it over the weekend. 900-page book. I read it over the weekend. It's a great book. And, and then he proceeds to hold it up every night on TV. I mean, just like a Susan Powder infomercial. You know, get flatter abs and tighter tummy. And by the way, read this book. And uh, it, was, it was awesome. It, it goes up to... Uh, number one on Amazon, and I get a call from our publisher, and they said, uh, hey, you know, your, your book is going to be on the New York Times extended list uh, next week, which, you know, it's by that time six years after it was published. That doesn't happen very often. And I said, well, that's really great. The next week, I get another call. Hey, your book's going to be in the top ten of the New York list. I, wow, that's really good. That's nice. Then I get the call. I can hear them partying in the background, hear the champagne corks popping. Woo-hoo! They got all the blowers going, you know. Your book's going to be number one on the New York Times. And I said, well, that, that's really good. I said, no, no, you don't get it. It's number one. I said, no, I heard you. That, that's great. He said, no, no, it's, it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be in Costco. It's, it's going to be in Target. It's going to be in Walmart. And I said, wait a minute. Our book's going to be in Walmart? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because that meant that we were getting out to the average people that I wanted to have read the book. It wasn't being read by pointy-headed academics. And so that's... Uh, that was cool for me. It's too bad I don't have the pictures. I could show you some pretty cool pictures of different people reading the book. David Limbaugh, Russia's brother. Uh, Michael W. Smith, actor Nick Searcy of the TV series Justified. Actor Adam Baldwin. Uh, all sorts of very interesting people uh, reading the book, including one of my favorites, Tom Brady, quarterback of the New England Patriots. Who? What else would a Patriot be reading, right? <laughs> Last December, we brought out what I think will be my last book, A Patriot's History of the Modern World, Volume 2. Ron mentioned that it, we had to divide it into two books. Um, I've had a very strong leading to move out of writing and move into something else. It may be filmmaking. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, and then uh, along with Patriot's History of the United States, we had something called a Patriot's History Reader, which is a collection of primary source documents to be used with Patriot's History of the United States. And we trademarked it all. <laughs> it's actually trademarked. Um, Patriot's History of the Modern World, Volume 1, goes from 1898 to the end of World War II. Volume 2 goes from the end of World War II to the present, and it's the whole world. It's India, China, Russia... Latin America, Middle East, everybody. So you can see why it was going to take more than one volume to cover all that stuff. I mean, uh, it's, it's, volume one was pretty dark. It's hard to cover two world wars and a depression and woohoo, you know, ha have it be light and airy. 
Uh, but volume two has some pretty interesting, funny kinds of stuff in it. We go into the car culture. We go into women's fashions and the battle between New York and, and Los Angeles and Hollywood over how women should look, whether it should be a, a stick or whether it should be you know, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, so it's got some fun stuff in it, too. Um, <clears throat> in the introduction of Patriot's History of the United States, Mike Allen and I listed three general traits that we thought had characterized the American experience. Now, remember, this is 2004, before the term American exceptionalism had really kind of taken root in the conservative movement and kind of gained cachet. All along, I intended to write a history of the world. So when that opportunity came along, and I partnered up with Dave Doherty, who is a, a genius, a farmer, a businessman in Evening Shade, Arkansas, one of the first things we decided we needed to do was to define American exceptionalism. People throw this term around. Niall Ferguson attempted to come up with a definition in one of his books. I don't think it was very good. Uh, Rush Limbaugh defines American exceptionalism as saying, well, we were the first. Well, that, that's true, but that doesn't define it. Being the first at something doesn't really define it. What are the characteristics of American exceptionalism? And so we set out to do that. What is Americanness? Many, especially those on the left, want to argue there's nothing at all exceptional about America. There's a famous monologue on the TV show The Newsroom with Jeff Daniels, where he talks about how, how there's nothing at all exceptional about this country. President Obama famously said, quote, the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Well, no, they don't. They love their countries and they think their countries have unique and special features, but I guarantee you not one of them thinks their nation should be the template for all nations in how to succeed, and quite the contrary. For many generations, the British thought no country out there possessed what they possessed. Nobody could become truly British. And this was the essence of their colonial system. It's one of the reasons why India and parts of Africa still aren't freed going into the 1950s from British imperialism because the British don't ever think they're ready. They can never match what we've got here in England. Well, what's American exceptionalism? Is American exceptionalism its culture? Is it Jerry Lewis or Kim Kardashian that makes America exceptional? And if you don't know the difference between the two, God help you. <laughs> Is it our inventiveness? Airplanes, computers, cars. Even though a lot of the products I just named, the cars, for example, were around a long time before Henry Ford, it's Americans that really take these things and turn them into useful profitable products that make sense on a daily basis. Dave and I eventually concluded that America and the, the inventiveness, the innovation we associate with America is a result of the elements of exceptionalism, not its cause. And so we concluded that American exceptionalism rests on four pillars. We call it the four pillars of American exceptionalism. Four foundations that as a whole are missing almost any place else in the world. I think you can make a weak case for England still possessing these, but they're eroding very fast in England. Germany had one of them for a while. Uh, otherwise, almost everybody else is limited to two of them. So let's understand that for now, I'm going to set aside the argument of wh whether America is the last best hope. I always get this at a college talk. Well, what about American imperialism? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about are these the characteristics that we call American exceptionalism? Then we can debate whether or not it's been good or bad for the world, but let's at least agree on these pillars. So here are the four pillars. First, a Christian, mostly Protestant, religion. Certainly few people would dispute that aside from Jamestown, most of the early British settlers to the New World came for religious freedom. Now they had to heavily cloak their language and their application for charters in business terminology. After all, no Anglican king in his right mind is going to give away a bunch of land to religious malcontents. But if they petition for a grant under the auspices of mercantilism, uh, under the auspices of doing good business for the crown, well, that's a different story. Wisely, 
None of the Puritans walked into Buckingham Palace and shouted to the king, Horror Babylon, give me land. I don't think that was going to fly very well. It does remind me of a true story, though. I know a televangelist. I won't mention his name, but a fairly handsome guy. And he was on a plane going back and forth across the country one time, and, and a, a beautiful woman sits down next to him, and, you know, she starts uh, flirting with him. And he's a married man, she starts flirting with him and, you know, trying to get a response out of him, and he keeps gently trying to tell her to buzz off, and she doesn't take the hint. And finally, he jumps up in the alley and goes, Horror Babylon! Horror Babylon! And she shut up the rest of the trip. So, guys, next time that uh, situation presents you, you might try that Horror Babylon tactic. But back to early America, except for Jamestown, which was admittedly a purely business venture of the London Company, most of the other American colonies, including Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, were intended from the start to be religious colonies. Christianity was the mainstay of the states as they came out of colonial status. Almost all of the states had direct references to God, and many had specific references to Jesus Christ in their state constitutions. How about these statistics? Five states granted privileges to specific religions that lasted past the Constitutional Convention period. Seven guarantee the, practice, the freedom to practice your religion. Delaware specified an oath of office that said, I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God. North Carolina's 1776 Constitution says, no person shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion. Five states required public office holders to be Christians. Seems like in many places today we're requiring them to be Muslims. Seven states required that public office holders state they believed in God. And most important, no state mentioned any religion other than Christianity. Moreover, the notion that the founders were deists is nonsense. Washington's handwritten manuscript in 1752 includes one of his prayers, quote, O most glorious God in Jesus Christ, I acknowledge and confess my guilt in the weak and imperfect performance of the duties of the day. Peter Lilbach's great book, George Washington's Sacred Fire, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Washington was a Christian. Now, Franklin repeatedly wrote and said things that indicated that while his belief in Jesus was flimsy to non-existent, he definitely believed in an interventionist God, not a watcher of the deist world view. We could go into the first Thanksgiving here, as I do in Patriots History of the United States, which was not the settlers thanking the Indians for saving them, but was a celebration of the end, really, of communism in Plymouth. Uh, they had begun with a communal system, system of communal grains and communal lands. And they basically starved. It was the same story, by the way, in Jamestown. Jamestown lasted uh, two winters before John Smith, a 26-year-old captain, said, hey, this isn't working, we're ditching this, and we're going to give everybody their own plot of land and their own grain. Here's your grain, your grain, your grain. He said, those who will not work, will not eat, have at it. And guess what? They had a surplus, right? But the same thing happens in Plymouth. And both at Jamestown and Plymouth, the colonists arrived with a quasi-socialist system. William Bradford wrote in Plymouth that it was as if the leaders thought they were, quote, wiser than God. Both abandoned their socialist system for an early form of free market capitalism, and both survived because of that change. It's important when discussing the religious origins of the colonies and even the founders that you not leap ahead to the 1820s or 30s or 40s to cite changes that occurred in America later. Rather, look at the change that, at where America was in the in 1600s and 1700s, and that's what we're talking about when we say America was a Christian and mostly Protestant nation. What's interesting is that a Christian religious foundation itself was not sufficient. It could have been perverted into a theocracy, as Oliver Cromwell imposed in England, or a religious tyranny. But it did not do so in America because of the second critical pillar, common law. This came to us via England from the Germanic tribes of the late Middle Ages. 
in its simplest form, common law means that God places the law in the hearts of men and that the people elect leaders to enforce the law that they already know. All right? This, this is in, as opposed to having a leader who is given the law from God or from the state who then imposes it on the people below. This is in part why the battle over the so-called news media in entertainment culture is so important because as political scientist Tim Grossclose has shown, it is not only irrefutably biased toward the left, but it tends to pull voters leftward all the time. Grossclose showed that the presence of the news media actually pulls people a little bit to the left. Common law is a critical factor. Germany lost its common law tradition by about 1500, and England today is losing it by associating with the European Union. Almost all of the rest of the world is based either on French civil law, spread largely through Napoleon, or Sharia law, spread largely through the sword. Note that it's not simply, as some people want to say, a written body of law. Oh, we, we wrote down our constitution. Or we have a written bill of rights. I'm sorry, the French had that. It's called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in 1789. And it was later codified into something called the Code Napoleon. And just for fun, I have a next door office mate who's from the country of Cameroon. And so I got the Cameroonian Constitution out and laid it up next to the U.S. Constitution. And lo and behold, there isn't a whole lot of difference. The Constitution of Cameroon looks a lot like the U.S. Constitution. And yet, Cameroon has a dictator. And despite what you think of Obama, we don't. Why? The difference, in large part, is common law. It's because it's about more than writing things down. It's about where the law comes from. With common law, the law comes first from God into the hearts of the people and then to a leader who puts those laws into action, puts into action what the people have already decided. We see this in Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. We see it in 2 Corinthians 3, 3. You are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And over and over, I could quote many, many more. But civil law, which existed in the Middle Ages under the term divine right of kings, starts at the top with a ruler who dispenses the law downward to the people. One system of law is bottom up, of the people, by the people, for the people. The other is top down, do what I say. One is ruled by elected representatives, the other is ruled by executive order. This is why Limbaugh's definition of American exceptionalism isn't sufficient. We may have been the first to order our society around limiting government, but there have been many, many since then that have tried that, and most of them have failed. Why? Because they don't have common law. They're, they're living under a different system. You can see how the combination of civil law and Christianity by themselves can constitute two enormous challenges for a tyrannical or a big state government. They're not insurmountable. But so far, no Christian common law nation has ever fallen to tyranny that I can think of. Remember, Germany had lost common law when it was uh, run over by Napoleon. Think of modern day Russia. We rightly celebrated when communism died there, but Russia has no heritage at all of common law. It's always been ruled by one dictator or another, a czar, a Lenin, a Stalin, a Putin. Written rights are taken as suggestions. The absence of a moral code of common law, even when you have a resurgent Christianity as you have in Russia, encourages the kinds of economic gangsterism today associated with that country. And I don't want to suggest that the concept of right and wrong isn't given to all people. Clearly, Soviet housewives exerted pressure on Gorbachev to get Russia out of Afghanistan after casualties mounted. But rather, I want to suggest that a suppressed people who have no tradition of common law doubt their own ability to govern and simply lack the practice. And I think this is one thing that we're, we're in danger of losing now is, is a group of citizens 
who know that they're in charge and who have the ability to govern, who practice governing. We have a lot of people who've just dropped out, and we have a lot of other people who just kind of go along to get along. Again, in that regard, America and perhaps Canada and Australia, by the way, did you see that the Australian Prime Minister is taking Obama on head on on climate change? He's going to try to, to resist. Boy, that uh, makes me want to move to Australia. In that regard, America and perhaps Canada and Australia were unique in that while it had an overseer, I should say they had an overseer, in the British Empire, we were all governed by that famous phrase, benign neglect, meaning we pretty much governed ourselves. Yet for about 170 years, we weren't entirely free to do something totally stupid. It's sort of like your teenagers, you know. You let them have the car keys, they gotta be back by a certain time, they gotta call in, you know, but they got the car. You know, so we had, in other words, a long period of practicing self-government under common law. It should already be obvious that America is exceptional because of two elements in its foundation, even if we didn't have the other two, but we did. The third element is a free market. We need to understand this was not present at our founding. Uh, there weren't, you know, a whole bunch of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates is running around at the American founding. Virtually all of the world at that time, at least the Western world, practiced an economic doctrine called mercantilism, which was that businesses operated for the benefit of the state or for government, to use Ronald Reagan's words. If you made a profit, fine, but making a profit was not the primary reason for the existence of a company at least in the eyes of the crown, the primary reason was to benefit England or Spain or France. Everyone was accustomed to taxes and subsidies that either encouraged or discouraged you from growing certain things or manufacturing certain things. But everybody was treated equally. You know, the Indians got their stuff, their subsidies, and they had their list of banned items. The West Indians had their subsidies for sugar, and they had their list of banned items. And we had our subsidies, and we had our list of banned items. So it was, it was very even. As most people know, the American Revolution really began with a resistance to this system when it changed from being even and fair to, being, uh, to singling out the American colonies for special taxes. And by the way, it's interesting. Most of those taxes, not all of them, but most of the early taxes related to one thing, food. You start messing with Americans' food, you're in trouble, right? I think Mayor Bloomberg figured that out when, you know, the court said his little 18-inch drink thing wasn't going to fly. But watch out when you come to take my ho-hos. I tell students that, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to see me on a street corner in a trench coat. And, Psst, buddy, ho-hos, ding-dongs, light bulbs. Plastic bags, you know, I'm going to have all this stuff available. So, uh, baggy ties. <clears throat> Contrary to the modern-day libertarian view, we did not instantly leap from mercantilism into full-blown capitalism. Adam Smith had only introduced his theory in 1776. This is an age before the Internet. News traveled slowly. People didn't read books online. And it was several years before people got around to reading Adam Smith. Neither Jefferson nor Hamilton in their prime in any way could be called capitalists. But both, for different reasons, moved very quickly away from mercantilism. Nevertheless, all the founders embraced many of the essential elements of capitalism. Protection of private property, sanctity of contracts, due process, freedom of speech for advertising, and so on. And they made these all components of our U.S. Constitution. A good exercise is to run through the U.S. Constitution and find every clause that directly or indirectly relates to business or trade. At any rate, by 1800, most American leaders could be called capitalists, even if some were still mild protectionists. And yet there were early bits and pieces of capitalism present in the first colonies. We already talked about Jamestown, and, and, and when the communal land tilling failed, they, they gave property out to each person. The light bulb went in on over John Smith's head and he distributed land to individuals. I always wondered if the, the guy 
who invented LSD if a black light went on over his head. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember, you kids won't remember this, but some of you are old enough to remember that uh, back in the day, Led Zeppelin records were accused. If you played Led Zeppelin backwards, you'd hear satanic messages, right? So I suggested that somebody, to prove this, go into a satanic meeting and record the satanic meeting, play it backwards, would you hear Stairway to Heaven? I don't know. And I always wonder about the dolphins. You know how you hear how the dolphins are so smart? Dol oh, dolphins are the smartest. Why can't they get out of the tuna nets if they're so smart? As I mentioned earlier, the same thing happened to Plymouth, where the pilgrims first employed a communal approach and starved. When land was distributed to individuals and people had to fend for themselves, suddenly they had a surplus. The final pillar, private property with titles and deeds is often viewed as a component of capitalism, but Dave and I thought it deserved to stand alone. Many countries have a version of a free market, but it cannot sustain itself, especially in troubled times, without solid and irrefutable security provided by titles and deeds. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, you know, he's constantly talking about titles and deeds and deeds and titles. And you think he's talking about count of this or duke of that or prince. No, those are the titles that come with the land. But he's talking about a physical piece of paper that says, I own these estates. Now, what's the significance of that? The significance is if the king comes to take it, you have at least that piece of paper that says, you gave this to me, you're wrong. Now, he still might get executed. Still might get drawn in court, but it's one more impediment between you and totalitarian government. And we saw this in, in, in 1215 with the Magna Carta. Uh, you know, all these guys forced the king to sign this saying, you have these titles and deeds. There's a guy named Hernando de Soto. Uh, 1990s, the Peruvian economist, he wrote a book called The Mystery of Capital. And he asked two questions. First of all, he said, Pretty obvious that capitalism is winning worldwide. You know, even the Chinese now are becoming capitalists. If capitalism has won, why aren't more people better off? Why do we still have so many poor people, or po, as I call them? Why do we have so many po? Okay. Then he asked another question. Is it that the po don't have anything? Do they not have stuff? You might remember the famous comedian George Carlin had a, a whole routine on stuff and how you, you go on vacation and take your stuff with you, then you go to the beach and take a little bit less stuff with you, and every place you go, you got stuff. All right? Do people have stuff? So he goes around the world, and, and he looks in Egypt, he looks in Peru, he looks in Thailand, and he finds that people own stuff, that they have cars, that they have houses. But here's the problem. They can't prove it. They don't have written titles and deeds. De Soto looked at four examples. One was in Egypt. I used, this is what I would show on the screen if I brought my stick. But in Egypt, it took between 6 and 14 years and 150 separate governmental steps to get title deed to desert land to develop a piece of desert land. Underscore desert, that means there's nothing there. Okay. Now, in 2004 or 5, my wife and I sold a house and we bought a new house. And we went down to the title agency, and on a desk about like this, they had all these pieces of paper around, and they just started passing them around. Sign here, sign here, initial here, sign here, sacrifice chicken here, sign there, turn around three times. You know, and at the end of an hour, all of that was done. One hour, one step, 150 steps, six to 14 years. This is what DeSoto says is the problem. This is why written titles and deeds are so critical. This ties in with a free market because you have to be able to buy and sell land with security that what you have and what you're, you're putting up is yours. Um, you know, most small businesses are initially financed either with money from the family uh, or by putting up your home or your car or something like that as collateral. Well, if you don't have a title deed, look, here's how stupid I was. When I was a kid, we used to race cars. I had a 350 Camaro that had a tunnel ram, a 2680 Holley carburetor. I don't even make that any fuel injection anymore. And a big old cam, you go like that, you know. 
And I was never this stupid. I never raced for a pink slip, but some of my friends did. They had really fast cars, and they were confident, and they would race for ownership of the other guy's car. The loser had to sign over his car to the other guy, right? So you don't want to get into that stuff. So it ties into the free market. You have to have security. Nothing was more important to Thomas Jefferson than spreading land out into the hands of the people from government. He did not write it, but he had a huge influence on the land ordinance of 1785. Land ordinance of 1785 was before the Constitution, and it's still one of the most important laws in Western civilization. Because in the land ordinance, it said we have this area called the Old Northwest. Today we call it Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois. And so we're going to survey this land. Nice blocks, sections, and townships. Beautiful squares. And we're going to sell it off to the people. The government owns this land now, but the government shouldn't own it. We need to sell it off to the people. This is Jefferson's view. This is why we've gotten so out of kilter. We lay aside land today for the federal government. The idea was you sell it to the people. They'll take care of it. But then something very interesting happened. As people moved out to settle, they didn't pay attention to those nice little squares. They started moving further out in Ohio. They're supposed to start around Chillicothe. But pretty soon, they're, they're settling in Dayton. They're settling in Greenville. And they're, they're settling you know, all the way up north. So here's common law. A dictator under civil law or divine right would have said, you heathen, you're breaking the law. Send out the Cossacks, round those people up, and kill them. But what do we do? We say, all right, clearly the people have this view of the law. Let's make the law conform to what's in the hearts of the people. So they create something called squatter's rights or preemption that said, if you sit on land for seven years and you develop it, it's yours. Even if it used to belong to somebody else, like a land baron out in Texas, if he doesn't get around and patrol his fences once every seven years, he doesn't deserve to have that land. It's yours. No other nation in the world has done this. You know, but we believe that it was important that people own land. He also had a tremendous influence on the Northwest Ordinance. Um, this one just flabbergasts me. The Northwest Ordinance set up our system of territories and states. It set up the system by which a new territory would get populated with people and then would become a state. Now, guess who proposes this? Jefferson. And why does he propose it? He's afraid that if a bunch of people settle out in Ohio and they don't have a way to become citizens, they'll become the next Americans. And they'll revolt against the government. And so Jefferson said he wanted those people to be a part of the United States, not, not colonists who will eventually revolt against us. So he said, we've got to find a way to make them citizens. You know, Rome struggled with this tremendously. They never knew what to do with the Germans. Do we let the Germans in and treat them as citizens, or do we keep them out and treat them as aliens? So here's, here's the amazing thing. In the Northwest Ordinance, one of the clauses said that out of this area of the Northwest, Ohio, Michigan, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, you should have no more than five states and no fewer than three. Now, here's what's so absolutely unbelievable about that. We were under the Articles of Confederation Congress, folks. There was no Senate and House. There was one body of legislators. All right? Think about that. When we later get a Senate, two senators for every state, and a House settled by population, think of what would have happened if they hadn't included that clause. You might have had one big state, Ohio, Michigan, all right, and it would only have two senators, but it would have how many representatives does Illinois have? How many does Wisconsin have? How many does Michigan have? How many is Add all those together, it would dominate the modern day House of Representatives. Or what if we had like 50 Rhode Islands? And each one only has one representative or two representatives in the House, but because each has two senators, this area of the Northwest would have 100 senators and would totally dominate the Senate. How amazing was it that they set up the House and the Senate, they set up the Northwest Ordinance that works perfectly with the House and the Senate, and the House and the Senate had not even been conceived yet. I just find that amazing. With these pillars, an outline to a student, virtually any aspect of American or world history 
can be the jumping off point for a discussion of any other period. For example, if you're reading about the Homestead Act in the 1860s, this is a great place to go into Jefferson's concepts about property, the land ordinance, and then later the Mill Acts and the development of developmental rights over pristine property rights. Um, we did not want land barons in America who held the land just for the purpose of keeping it out of the hands of other people like they were doing in England and Europe. You know, the, the English land barons enclosed the land basically so nobody else could have it. But in America, we had a commitment to developing the land and a priority of developing land over pristine property rights. So consider the various modern-day African states, such as Zimbabwe or Cameroon. They have elections there, don't they? Yet their elections result in a virtual dictatorship almost every time. Regardless of your opinion of President Obama, as I said, he's hardly a dictator and does have, at least in theory, limitations in the form of checks and balances, a Supreme Court, a few honest people in the media, and once in a while, when they find their spines, a Republican Party. So why the difference? It's because of common law. Cameroon and Zimbabwe are under civil law, came to them from France, and as such, the people, they don't know what's best for them. The leader, of course, always does. These are heavy and somber discussions, but it doesn't mean that history can't be fun as well, and in Patriot's History of the Modern World, Volume 2, we have some of my favorite discussions about fashion in the mid-20th century, the battle between New York designers and Hollywood moguls over the most desirable female form, whether it was Twiggy or Raquel Welch, my vote's for Raquel, uh, and how this ultimately intertwines with the toy industry, Barbie, and how diet and the anti-fat and anti-meat campaigns began in the 1960s as part uh, or an element of this. One of my favorite chapters is called The Ash Heap of History, about Ronald Reagan and the end of the Cold War. I still think it's one of the best chapters on Reagan ever written. Some of you may be old enough to recall that when Reagan announced his Star Wars program, journalists and the American left laughed and they called it a fantasy. But the Russians weren't laughing. You know, they called it Star Wars, right? But the Russians weren't laughing. That's because Gorbachev knew that 40 years earlier, in four years of war, we built 95,000 tanks we built a tank up in Lima in four and a half hours from scratch. That's less than time it takes you students to write one of your papers for one of your classes, right? We built 310,000 airplanes. We built a Liberty ship, turning them out like quarter pounders with cheese. We built a Liberty ship in four and a half days from scratch. Just absolutely astounding. Gorbachev knew we could do this. Uh, I have a great image. Again, I wish I had this, but it's a picture of a cruise missile, and it's just about to hit the state flower of Ohio, better known as an orange pylon. It's just about to hit that. It's fired from 1,000 miles away. Gorbachev knew we could do that. With our massive lead in technology, conservative estimates today say that we were 15 years ahead of the Soviets in computer technology. We could easily field a Star Wars system. By the way, the Star Wars, the reason the media called it Star Wars is they were locked into the 1950s. A lot of these guys grew up in the 50s. And back in my day, if you wanted to ridicule something, you called it Buck Rogers. None of you kids here remember Buck Rogers, but Buck Rogers was this far out guy and he'd fly around outer space without a helmet or anything, just breathing non-oxygen. He just fly, flew around in outer space and, and he had some sort of propulsion pack. He had this goofy little helmet and uh, had this ray gun that looked like you took a, uh, a toilet plunger and put it on the end of a ray gun. I guess you could kill the alien and suck your toilet out at the same time. It was a multitask weapon. But they called it... Star Wars, because they wanted to ridicule it. And the thing was, there had been enormous changes since Buck Rogers. One change, well, gee, uh, we went to the moon. Another change, we were putting space shuttles up almost every couple of months. We were going into space all the time. Another change, we had developed lasers. We had actually used lasers, okay? And the biggest change, most people had seen Star Wars. And the Luke Skywalker, you know, the young Mark Hamill, P-51, 
people knew he was Reagan. People knew Reagan was Luke. He had that same jaunty attitude. Well, there you go again. He just had that kind of we can overcome the universe attitude, you know. There's a great um, a little portrait that occurs when Reagan and Gorbachev first meet at Reykjavik, Iceland for their first, I think, first or second um, uh, summit talk. And Reagan is already there, and Gorbachev arrives in a limousine, and Reagan walks outside in a suit just like this one, no hat, no overcoat, just, and it's got to be freezing. Walks outside just, you know, ruddy-cheeked and just happy, and Gorbachev climbs out of this thing, and he's got this frumpy, dumpy little Russian cap on, this little hat, you know, square pillbox hat like the thing used to wear in the Fantastic Four. And he's got this trench coat. He comes up, here's Reagan, you know, and the, the image struck the reporters. They go, Gorbachev looks 20 years older than Reagan. And, and the reason was Reagan had this air of optimism and this can-do spirit. Well, you know, so that means, of course, that if Reagan is Luke, then who are all these other guys? Well, the Soviet dictators, if you ever look at them, they look like the emperor, the evil emperor, you know. In fact, Brezhnev, I think, auditioned for the role. He, he looks just like the evil emperor if you flash the picture back, you know. And Gorbachev, if you look at Darth without the helmet, he looks just like Gorbachev. A little, put on a little white pancake makeup, but it's, you know, it's dark. There's a strong current of Western dominance in our books. You could even say American dominance. And yet it's amazing to think that even today some of the great technolog technological marvels, such as Japan's Chubu Airport, the Petronas Towers, the Chunnel, the Sale Hotel in Dubai, these were all designed in the West. That provides a great theme discussion of the three great architects of the early 20th century. We, we do a discussion of Frank Lloyd Wright, of Antoni Gaudi, and of Walter Gropius, architects who all worked at the same time. And yet it's very interesting. These great architects are fascinating because they embody different concepts of nature. Uh, Wright of nature... Gaudi, God, and man, Gropius. Or to the more spiritually minded, you could say they embody body, spirit, and mind. American exceptionalism is the most appropriate gateway to examine any of these questions about intellectual adventure, scientific achievement, business enterprise, and, of course, political freedom. It makes for an easy comparison and contrast to world history to the specific history of any country. In short, I think there's almost nothing you can't teach using the Patriots history series as a springboard. So while the West in many cases never had common law, or in the case of Germany lost it, and in the case of Britain is losing it, only the US has consistently and permanently had all four of these pillars of exceptionalism. These constitute the character of our country, and as Margaret Thatcher said, guard your thoughts, because your thoughts become your speech. Guard your speech because your speech becomes your actions. Guard your actions because your actions become your habits. Guard your habits because your habits become your character. And guard your, your character because your character becomes your destiny. I submit to you that to understand America's destiny and our future, it's more critical than ever to understand our foundations of success our character so they can be shared with whoever wants them. And I would suggest to you that this is also why there is an assault underway right now by the media to rewrite our past, so-called revisionist history, because it's a way of controlling our future by changing our character. And uh, I think with that, I'll take questions here from the audience since I know you guys are going to have a lot of uh, controversial questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, this is the old, um, you know, America's about to crumble uh, approach. And you could say that about almost any period in American history. You go back through and you read the commentaries of the day in, the, in 1776 or in 1800 or in 1862 or whatever it is, and you'll hear many, many, many of these same comments from contemporaries back then. Um, 
we always think we're living in the most perilous times, the closest to collapse, and there's no question that these institutions are hugely under assault. Just take the uh, private property with titles and deeds, for example. Federal government's the largest landholder in America. It, it's, it's a major, major issue. But as a historian, what constantly stands out to me is how quickly things change in history, literally at the drop of a hat. You know, turn on a dime. It, it's really amazing. If you look at, um, if you look at Christmas 1776, there was no America. We were finished. George Washington was on the march with an army of about 1,500 men down from 17,000. He had lost every single battle he had fought, and yet he was on the cusp 24 hours later, he would fight a battle that would literally turn around the entire revolution. Give hope to the revolution, start bringing money in, bring more volunteers in. Then he fought a second battle a couple of days after that. Turn everything around. Um, if you were sitting around a dinner table in um, June, June 1st, 1942, and you're, you're looking at how the war is going, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, the Germans are in the suburbs of Moscow. They've defeated every single person, every country in Europe except England, and the English really were running out of money. Churchill's famous line that the Americans will give us weapons as long as we can pay for them, and then when we can't pay for them any longer, they'll still give us the weapons, right? But you look in the Pacific, we had not won a single battle. Japanese conquered more people in less time than any empire in human history, they did so really at the loss of one destroyer. It, there were two aircraft carriers left in the entire Pacific to oppose them. They'd sunk every battleship, every, every heavy cruiser, sunk or damaged all aircraft carriers, and yet, within five days, the empire of Japan could not win another single battle. They were finished. So, I agree with you, it looks bleak. Things are under assault. Maybe as they never have been, but again, when you read a lot of history like I do, every generation seems to think they're under assault the same way. So I would urge you to remember that, you know, with God, nothing is impossible. Things turn on a dime, you know, but God, Moses is this guy sitting out in, the, in Midian in the middle of nowhere. All of a sudden, he <laughs> sees a burning bush, you know. I mean, these kinds of things turn around, and um, so I'm not convinced we're in, in, at the end times yet. Okay, her question is, what about the land grabs by the federal government? Are they motivated by environmentalists or just the desire for more power? Let me take you back to where these really originated. After the West pretty much got settled and people thought they had most of the available farmland, there were a lot of cattle ranchers out West. And the cattle ranchers didn't want to have to buy all this land to graze their cattle on. So they said to the government, why don't you just let us graze your, the cattle on this federal land and we'll pay you fees. So the government starts blocking off this land for these ranchers. And my dad was a rancher. I mean, I, you know, I'm not coming down on ranchers. I'm just saying its origin was really that these guys wanted to sequester the land off so people didn't start settling out there and blocking it off for, uh, for farming when they wanted to keep it for cattle ranching. Now, by the 1930s and 40s, federal government says, oh, We'll just consider this land permanently ours. And of course, by then you had Teddy Roosevelt's idea coming in that, well, we need to have these national parks. Now, I certainly don't want to, to you know, destroy Yellowstone or do, do away with our national parks, but I'm a firm believer that private individuals can, can buy up and, and police the best parks in the world. You know, uh, they do a much better job as individuals. Private sector, did you know this, that saved the buffalo? The buffalo, one of these great lies about American history, the buffalo were on the verge of extinction. It is true. Whites almost killed off all the buffalo. That's true. What you don't ever hear is that the Indians were already on a path to exterminate the buffalo. We have three new books that came out in the 1990s, early 2000s, one by a guy from Princeton, one guy from a guy from Rutgers, and one from a guy from uh, Montana State. And they all come to the same conclusion. The Indians were rapidly exterminating the buffalo herds. In come the whites, and they just go faster because they have better technology. Here's the part. Oh, and you've all heard this, right? 
The Indians used all parts of the buffalo. How many of you heard that in going to school? Indians used all parts of the buffalo. Yeah, that's true, but it doesn't mean what you think. What you think is that the Indians kill a herd of buffalo and then zzzz, just kind of like, you know, people at the Luby's free buffet line, you know, zzzz, just kind of go through and there's nothing left. That's not what happened. We have eyewitness reports of settlers going across the prairie seeing entire herds of buffalo lying there, dead, dead buffalo. The Indians would use the hides when they needed hides. They would use the meat when they were hungry. They would use the blood and the bones when they needed to build teepees or do war paint. So yeah, they used all parts of the buffalo, but not always all at once. And one of the ironies is, it was the white man that used all parts of the buffalo all at once. They couldn't stand to see waste. They said, wait, take those bones, grind, grind them up, and we're going to use those for cement powder. And then take those hides, we're going to make some nice shoes out of those. And, and you would see, if you go on Wikipedia even, you'll see, the, uh, if you go to the buffalo section, you'll see these big stacks of buffalo bones that they would ship back east for use in, in making cement. Here's, here's the part nobody tells you about. It was white philanthropists who saved the buffalo. Um, Charles Goodnight, famous rancher, captured buffalo calves, and he slowly bred them into a herd of about 700 animals that he then gave to Wood National Buffalo Park in Canada. John D. Rockefeller, famous uh, banker, or uh, oil man, bought 20,000 acres of western land just to raise buffalo on it. Uh, all sorts of ranchers bred buffalo with cattle. They called it beefalo, and they sold it for its meat. And, uh, and one guy boasted in, a, in an advertisement, we sell buffalo for circuses, um, parades, um, zoos, and barbecues. And today, what's interesting is there are more buffalo raised on private ranches solely for their meat than exist on all of the, all of the preserves government and private put together. Um, so the answer to your question is it began really at the behest of the ranchers. It was taken over by the environmentalists and the big government types. And now they see it as a way of, of controlling people. Because if there's not enough land out there for people to go own their own homes and get their own land, they'll have to come to the cities and we got them when we can, you know, control them in the cities. Yes, sir. Do you, have you written any or do you know of any, think of Indians that are good factual histor history of cowboys and Indians? Yeah, go to our Patriots History of the United States and, and look. We have 40 pages of end notes. Okay, look in, look in the section on the Wild West, on the West, and look at the end notes, and you'll see plenty of good sources there. And by the way, people, you know, will compare or contrast us to uh, Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States. I challenge you to look at what he says in his end notes about the Indians. Just kidding. He doesn't have any end notes. Well, we have 40 pages of notes, and, and we have many, many notes that list all the sources, and you'll find something there. there you know, and we give you a commentary on them, too. Yes, sir. With all this revisionist history going on, where are you finding your primary sources? Primary sources. I mean, primary sources are primary sources. They can't be revised. I mean, you know. And where are, you, are you going to the library? Yeah. The, the Library of Congress? Yeah. In fact, it was interesting. Today, I just now got some documents from the Reagan Library that I visited in 2010 to help write the Red Book because I have a chapter in there about Reagan. And just now, they declassified a couple of the documents on the Reagan uh, Beirut Marine thing. And I just now got that today. A little bit late for me to use in the book, I might say. But uh, yeah, I, I go to the original sources and the libraries. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I don't like the term special interest groups because we're all special interest groups. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody has something they want from government. Uh, believe me, if government offered, many of you would jump to take a goodie from government. You know, we, we all, most of us take the, who here does not take the deduction on your mortgage? In, your mortgage? Well, that's a government subsidy, right? <laughs> So I don't like the term special interest. It kind of denotes that there's this group of evil people over here and the rest of us are virtuous. What we have are all sorts of people who banded together to get their ideas across and some have more money and more clout than others, but that doesn't make them inherently wrong. Um, okay, we, my, okay. My, my um, question concerning that has to do more with the fact that by having so many 
Yeah. We got away from being American and we became this kind of American. Okay. Okay. Why don't we ask James Madison what he thought of that? And, and I've got a book back there, What Would the Founders Say, right? And, and I went into 10 issues, and I looked not only what they said, but what they did. Madison, he didn't call them special interests. He called them factions. You know what his answer was? Let faction check faction. In other words, no faction will get too big because somebody else is going to step up and oppose them. And as far as it's not being American, that, that is an issue in that what's under assault is, it's not per se special interest groups. What's under assault is American exceptionalism. And we can have all these groups as long as all of them understand we're all Americans, we're all doing this. We want to get ahead, but we're all Americans. And what is being taught today in many places is that America is not exceptional. We're just one of many nations, and who's to say that we're, who are we to tell somebody else what to do? We're exceptional. That's why we get to tell you what to do. I mean, that, that would be my answer. Yes, sir. So how, uh, so how does that uh, kind of leap into the subject of isolationism? Um, by that you mean, should we be isolationist? Okay. I have in uh, 48 Liberal Lies, I have a chapter. Uh, one of the lies is that Thomas Jefferson was this great isolationist. He's always held up as this great. Uh-uh. Thomas Jefferson actually leads us into our first foreign war, the war against the Barbary pirates. And, oh, he didn't have a declaration of war for that one, did he? He used a joint resolution of Congress. Oh, and it sounds like George Bush because Jefferson said, you're either with the Barbary pirates or you're with us. And, and he went to war not just against Tripoli, which cut down our flagpole and caused the war itself. He went to war with all the Barbary states just on the assumption they were all aiding Tripoli, and they hadn't made a statement not to. I think, and I, I say this in What Would the Founders Say, I, I think that Washington is often misquoted and misunderstood when he talks about avoiding entangling alliances. You've got to finish out what he says for 20 years. Now, why 20 years, George? Well, you see, we don't have a very big army. And we're just developing our population, and we don't have a lot of iron foundries or, or uh, textile mills to do weapons or, or to make uh, uniforms. But he says within 20 years, and Washington said this, within, and Hamilton wrote it for him, but Washington said it. Within 20 years, we will be formidable enough, and I'm put it in modern English, nobody will dare screw with us. In 20 years, we're going to be strong enough that we can slap people upside the head if they get out of line, Right? And, uh, and, and so I don't think Washington ever meant we should never have an alliance. And I don't think we should, he meant we should never deploy troops abroad. I think he meant we can't do it right away or we'll get squished like a bug. Okay, fair tax. Okay, fair tax. Um, what we have today is horrible. I think we'll, we'd all agree on that. In fact, just yesterday I was doing income taxes in my business and economic history program. And I wouldn't have had this even if I brought my slides, but I could show you a picture of the very first income tax. It's one page. The form is one page. Any of us could have filled out our form. Oh, and who paid taxes? Well, if you didn't make $20,000 in 1913, you didn't pay any taxes at all. $20,000 in 1913, how much was that? Well, let me give you a clue. In 1913, you could buy a steak dinner for a nickel. You could buy a suit of men's clothes for three bucks. So there weren't many Americans who made $20,000. You know what the $20,000 bracket paid? 1%. You want to know what the Bill Gateses and the Rockefellers paid the ultra-rich? 6%. 6%. Now, this is the way they, this is kind of off your question, but this is how they got the income tax in. You ever wonder how did they get this abomination in? It was simple. When it was introduced, it was really simple, and nobody was going to pay taxes. And even those who did pay it, you'd never feel it. Uh, all right. Okay. Then World War I hits. And all of a sudden, that 1%, oh, they're paying 25%. The 6%, oh, they're paying 75%. So after World War I, the Coolidge and Harding administration, or Harding Coolidge administrations, lower the taxes. And they lower the 75 down to 
um, was 25, and they lower the 25 down to 5. Everybody goes, woo, yeah, yeah. Did you see what just happened? They raised taxes on the rich threefold, and they raised taxes on the middle class and poor fivefold. And everybody went, yeah, they throw a party. Anyway, to get to your point about the fair tax, I have reservations about the fair tax. I have two main reservations. First, I don't think under the, the system as it is designed by, by Lindner and Bortz and those guys, they start out by giving people, poor people, a refund, a, a tax rebate, a, a refund. I don't think that is a fair way to start any tax system, to hand out money. The very first thing you do is you hand out money. That ain't right. The second problem I have with it is I don't ever like business to be the tax collector. I think government should be the tax collector. When you elect me dictator of America, the first change that I will make is I will move tax day from April 15th to November 1st. That means that you're going to be, oh, here's the second change I'd make. You, you would lose all withholding. From now on, you write one check on November 1st for all of your income taxes. Now, who do you think will ever elect another Democrat if you've got to write a check on November 1st for umpteen thousand dollars? Uh-uh. But withholding makes it so that you don't notice it. It comes out a little bit, and, you, and they snuck that in during World War II. Okay? So I like government to be the tax collector because your ire ought to be directed at government, not your fellow businessman, number one. And number two, the it's, it's, Constitution says it's government's job to collect taxes. Collect the taxes. Don't foist it off on Walmart. You do it. Okay, so those are my two reservations with the fair tax. I'm more of a flat tax guy. I think we ought to have a 15 or 20 percent flat tax, no deductions, no charity, no home mortgage, no, no deductions, you know, no Swicart Beneficial Charity Foundation, nothing like that. You know, what did you make last year? Send in 15 percent. What did you make? Send in whatever it is, 20 percent. Send it all in. And I think. If the Russians can do it, folks, we can do it. They have a flat tax in Russia. For God's sake, we can do it. Uh, another interesting uh, thing. Uh, you notice the United States, we've taken over a lot of places, defeated a lot of yeah. uh, countries, you know, and moved in and taken over. Why is it that we always seem to establish, or these, these countries that we get involved in, always seem to establish a European parliamentary government we never try to put a uh, constitutional republic in, yeah. at least not to my knowledge. Yeah, the, I don't think we've ever done it. And why is that? that? That's a good point, and it's almost always because when we take them over, they have had a prior culture of civil law. Think of the Philippines. Okay, uh, The Philippines, what did they have for uh, 100 years before we get there? They have Spanish law, which is basically the Code Napoleon uh, coming down to them. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Most of these, these places are conquered by us, but, but they are not American culture. They are a European colony that we have in turn taken over from some European power. I agree. I think that's a problem. But it's a real issue. So far, nobody has adopted both Christianity and common law from some other system. Nobody. It'll be interesting to see where the Chinese go. Uh, China is the largest Christian nation on earth today. There are more Christians in China than in any other country in the world. Africa is rapidly becoming the most Christian continent in the world. There are more Christian Africans than any place else in the world. Um, will they be able to, to turn that around and put common law in? Common law is very difficult to get, you know, kind of as, a, a, as an outside thing. But it does come as a byproduct of the Judeo-Christian system because throughout you know the judeo-christian system the idea was that god puts the law in the hearts of the people of people know what's right because they answer to god not to the ruler so it's it's a conundrum interesting I'll, I'll just mention our second film that we're almost done with is called other walls to fall we took off the idea of rock and the wall being about the fall of the berlin wall and rock music and the fall of the berlin wall and other walls to fall is about music in other oppressed parts of the world and we interviewed a lot of muslims and uh, we got stuff from inside Tehran from a heavy metal band inside Tehran that smuggled material out. And one of the things the guy said in the interview, this is a musician, he says, if you're against Islam, you're against the government, that's the way it is. Uh, they get it. 
I mean, they understand that, that their system, their religious worldview is a problem. And, and so some of them try and fudge it and say, well, you know, that's not really what the Quran sa says. Wrong. But they say that's not what the Quran says. And others say, no, there is a problem here. You know, it's an inherently government, theocracy, and state all in one, one uh, ball of wax. Okay, I've got stuff on sale in the back. I'll sign books for you. Thank you very much for having me up here. You.